baby and they consider one another uh, sisters. And uh, she and Bonnie have had an argument and uh, Bonnie has left her and uh, Prudence is continuing this journey on her, on her own. Uh, she's thinking over, you know, the, 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 the argument with Bonnie when this scene uh, takes, uh, takes place. Prudence was puzzling over that when she felt weight settle on the seat next to her. She turned gratefully to greet Bonnie. Instead, she found herself being admired, rather frankly, by a man twice her age at the very least. His sideburns were fashionably long and shiny with oil, and he was chewing a wad of tobacco that made one cheek bulge like a tumor. He doffed his derby and gave her a smile that revealed brown teeth. Traveling alone, are we? Prudence sighed. She smoothed her skirt. It was long and straight as she refused to wear the monstrous crinolines that took up so much space and made it almost impossible to move about. Then she adjusted her cornet and retied it carefully about beneath her chin. The man grew impatient. Didn't you hear me, miss? he asked, and, and his voice was oilier than his hair. I said, we're traveling alone, are we? <laughs> Finally, Prudence looked at him. The brown smile widened in anticipation. She said, I know not how we are traveling, sir. I know how I am traveling, but I fail to understand why that would be any concern of yours. Now his smile shrank down to almost nothing, only to be reborn as a little smirk. <laughs> I see, you're a real spitfire, he said, but that's all right with me. I like a gal with spunk. <laughs> he patted her hand as he said it. She pulled away and he laughed. Prudence sighed. There were always some who were more difficult than others, always some who refused to get the message. He replaced the derby. Name's Logan, honey. Marcus Aurelius Logan from New York City. I'm a manufacturer, going down to Dixie to make my fortune. Lots of money down there right now for a man knows where to look. How about you? What are you going down for? He pinned, she pinned him with a look. Again, she said, I failed to understand why my plans should be any concern of yours. And now the smile died altogether, replaced by a hard look, such as you might give a cur that has bitten you after you have fed it. I'm just trying to be sociable with you, he said, past the time of day. But it appears to me you're in dire need of someone to teach you some manners. Prudence smiled sweetly. And would that person be you? He returned the smile, scooted close, closer. It just might be if you play your cards right. Thank you for the offer, she said, but I would sooner leap from a bridge and dash my brains out on the rocks below. <laughs> his fleshy face went cold and dark. He leaned in close. His breath was a sour mix of tobacco and mash. His voice became a guttural whisper. Look, you highfalutin New England bitch, I tried to be nice to you, but I'll be damned if I'm going to let some skinny strumpet talk to me like, like, he paused in confusion, looking down to discover what it was that was pressing into his left testicle. <laughs> Prudence had produced a derringer and was holding the barrel against him. Marcus Aurelius Logan looked up, forcing a smile. You really think you can hurt me with that toy gun, honey? Prudence gave him another sweet smile. It is small, she admitted, but I believe it is positioned where it can do the most good. <laughs> you wouldn't, he said. You don't have the nerve. I suppose there is but one way to find out, she told him. She held his gaze. He blinked, blinked again, then finally pulled back. Watching her warily, he stood up, announcing loudly, I'm certain I can find more congenial company elsewhere. She watched him exit the car, his gait stiff-legged and quick. <laughs> Only when the door had closed behind him did she replace the weapon in her bag. <laughs>